Greetings and salutations gamers, my name is Kyle, also known as Gamers Weekend, and welcome back to Elden Ring. Last time we took on Rune Level 1, a fairly simple but flexible challenge that helped us get ready for the more difficult tasks to come. But today, we're tackling a challenge that forced me to change the way I looked at Elden Ring. I've been through many challenges on this channel, from the simple Dark Souls 2 with only pyromancies to the insanity that was Armor of Thorns only New Game Plus Dark Souls Remastered. But my favorite challenges have always been the ones that are like puzzles. Challenges that force you to think outside of the box, ones that slowly come together with clever planning and routing. And that may be why today's challenge, Elden Ring without consuming stamina, may be my favorite challenge run to date. The level of restriction where this challenge skates just barely on the line of possibility makes this one a thrill to get through. And to answer the question on the back of everybody's mind, yes, it is possible. Not only is it possible to beat, but it's also possible to claim every single remembrance in the game with these restrictions. But before we get into all of that, let's go over the rules. For this run, we are not allowed to consume stamina by any means. If the little green bar goes down at all, then it's out of the question. If for any reason we accidentally use stamina, then we must immediately reset to our last checkpoint, either by dying or by using our memory of grace. The Memory of Grace consumes all of our runes, so most of the time I'll probably take that option. Our main goal is to reach the end of the game, although we will be going after every single remembrance. And lastly, we won't be using any glitches this run. If we're getting through this game, then it's going to be accomplished through the normal means. One last thing before we get started, if you enjoy this video or any of my other past videos, then it would mean a lot to me if you press the subscribe button. It's the number one way to let me and the YouTube algorithm know that this is the kind of content that you want to see. That should be about it. I hope each and every one of you are having a wonderful day, and without further ado, this is the Staminaless Elden Ring Challenge. Every time I've brought up the idea of this challenge to other people, the first question has always been the same thing. How? Which is completely understandable, as just about everything in the game requires stamina. Attacking, casting spells, shooting arrows or bolts, throwing throwables, rolling, backstepping, sprinting, jumping, parrying, reposting, and backstabbing. All of it takes stamina. Elden Ring even included taking damage on a ladder causing you to lose stamina, and falling from too far to a height also takes stamina because you landed a little too hard. We are restricted from doing any of these things. At least, for most of the game. Because Elden Ring did include a mechanic that will make bits of this run much more realistic. In Elden Ring, all of these actions will cause you to lose stamina, given that you're in combat, but in this game, there's a unique mechanic around enemy aggression. When we aren't engaged by an enemy, the game considers us to be out of combat, and none of our actions, regardless of what they would have cost beforehand, will actually cost stamina. The easiest way to tell when you're out of combat is to set your HUD to auto, which will cause the HUD to fade away as you exit combat. That means that we can do all of the previously mentioned actions as long as there's nothing attacking us. That's pretty good news, as long as we aren't in combat there shouldn't be any sections of the game that we can't progress through. Any mandatory jumps or platforming can be done so long as we get out of combat. It'll also make riding through the overworld much more bearable, although we'll have to be careful about triggering enemy aggression. But this is not a solution we can apply to the entire game. The second we enter a boss room we're in combat, and most of the tricky segments that'll require we exit combat are covered in enemies. Out of combat mechanics aren't going to solve everything. Thankfully, you don't have to look too far to find our first form of self-defense, the Spirit Ashes. Summoning these things doesn't consume any stamina, and almost every boss arena in the game has the ability to summon inside of it. This is going to be a great help, but not exactly enough to finish off the game. For one, we can only summon in the segments the game allows, and a lot of the segments that require us to platform don't give us that ability. Additionally, we don't have the ability to cast healing magic to support our summons, so they'd be all on their own for the tougher boss fights. It's entirely possible they could handle the bosses, but it's extremely unlikely. Which leads us to the final basic component of the run, Weapon Arts. Just about every single weapon art in the game consumes stamina. 
But after hours of research and coming through Elden Ring weapon arts, we finally found a total of four weapon arts that do not require stamina. Two of them being unique to the weapons they're on, three of them having a requirement of at least one boss, and the last one being unable to deal damage whatsoever. We'll talk about them as we get to them, but these four weapon arts increase our run versatility by an absolutely insane amount. With the ability to defend ourselves, we'll actually be able to clear out enemies and contribute during boss fights. That being said, every single boss will still be done using only summons and these specific weapon arts. Rolling, jumping, sprinting, attacking, or casting spells are all out of the question during bosses. Keep that in mind as we go through the entire game. With all of this in mind, we can finally construct a route to get through the game. All that's left is to put it all together. We start off by picking the Vagabond character and select the Golden Seed gift. Since we won't be able to avoid attacks, armor is going to be a big help this run, and flasks are an essential resource. We aren't able to do anything against the Thousand Hand Thumper, so we'll go ahead and let it do its thing so we can make our way to the first steps. Our first order of business is getting Torin. We'll be able to use his sprint out of combat, and even when we're in combat, his trotting speed is much faster than our walking speed. It's going to make things a lot easier to get around. We can visit Rodrika for the jellyfish and head back to the Church of Alay for the Lone Wolves and Calling Bell, the first essential item of the run. Just by having the Lone Wolves, you already open up a large amount of areas where we can clear enemies, like this Godric soldier who guards the Lord Sworn Greatsword. We'll be using one of our stamina-less weapon arts on this weapon a bit later. Next on my list is the Wondrous Physic in a Sacred Tier for more healing since it's easy to access, and then through the nearby teleport gate to take us to Dragon Barrow. There's a couple golden seeds here to pick up, and we can access a few essential early game locations from here fairly easily. Lens Rise is one of the first places we'll unlock, and then we make our way to Fort Faroth. From there, we can drop down the Jump Geyser next to the Giant Head and collect the next Sacred Tier from the Plague Church near Millicent. Next, we'll head down the cliffside and into the Town of Sorcery to claim the Rotten Stray Ashes and talk to Melina in order to access Roundtable Hold. We take this very specific route through Kaelid, rather than through locations like the Trap Chest and Mines, in order to minimize the amount of enemies we encounter while we're here, which will minimize the amount of times we risk using stamina. From here, we can quickly make our way around Stormvale Castle and into Lyurnia to grab a quick Sacred Tear, and then it's finally time to head to the Weeping Peninsula. Here, we can nab another Golden Seed and three more Sacred Tears before starting to chase after one of the Loot Scarabs. The one we're after in particular is a bit annoying as it teleports around, but there's an easy solution to this one. We can grab some Kukris between the Church of Alay and Stormhill Gates, and then use the Jump Geyser near the Castle Morn Outer Gates to avoid drawing the Golem Archer's aggro. This will keep us out of combat long enough to throw a Kukri at the Scarab, which is more than enough to kill it. This particular one gives us Poison Mist, a spell that normally consumes stamina, but we can abuse certain game mechanics to turn it into a powerful weapon in a few places. Our first main goal of the run is to take out Godric. That'll unlock our first stamina-less weapon art. In order to do that, we're going to need to put some power into our Ash Summons. Tombsward Catacombs is the first place we'll head in order to get our hands on Grave Glove Warts 1 and 2. The fire statue sections were surprisingly easy to clear stamina-less. If you don't try to get up from the fire immediately and let your character naturally get up, it's the perfect amount of time to navigate the hallways. The next catacombs we'll hit are the minor Erdtree catacombs in Kaelid. The Scarlet Rotten skeletons here make navigating a little rough, but the glove warts are fairly easy to get to. Specifically, we're here to grab 3, 4, and 5. The last areas we're headed to here are in Altus, so we'll have to grab the elevator medallions. The forts were actually surprisingly easy to navigate without rolling or sprinting. We had to be careful about movements in a couple of spots, but we didn't run into any major issues. Navigating Lyurnia without stamina was a little tricky since there's a lot of enemies here that will enter combat from a pretty long distance. It required a lot of patience and trigger discipline, for a lack of a better term, in order to navigate our way through. Eventually, we made our way to the dragon and snuck behind it fast enough to grab our key and fast travel out. Then a quick teleport gate from Laceguard to the Academy Gates and we were on our way to the lift through Bellum Highway. We of course made sure to stop by the church here to grab another sacred tier. 
I had the idea to use Raya's quest line to take me to Volcano Manor, and then travel a back way through Mount Gelmir in order to access the Gelmir Hero's Grave. This ended up being not as intuitive as it sounded, so we slowly made our way through Altus to access from the drawbridge. I thought that we could claim some more upgrades from the Gelmir Hero's Grave, but this place seemed pretty impenetrable in our current state. The nearby skeletons made any kind of movement impossible, and the chariot was extremely difficult to get around without having the ability to sprint. This unfortunately was a bust. Altus wasn't completely fruitless though, as we could grab a Glovewort 6 from the Oriza side tomb. We've got enough to make a plus 6 Ash, which should do pretty well against the Stormveil bosses, although we are in need of runes and would feel a lot more comfortable with better stats to keep us alive. For this, we'll head down the elevator to Space Mountain where we can grab some Gold Pickled Foul Feet and the Merica Scar Seal. Merica Scar Seal in particular will improve our faith enough to cast Poison Mist, and back at Lens Rise we can bait the ball into falling off the cliff to give us enough runes to purchase a Two Fingers Talisman from Round Table. With this setup, we can clear out a boss we'll require later in the run to get a bunch of runes super early. We allocate most of our flasks into blues and make our way up to the Draconic Tree Sentinel. Heading along the far side will let us sneak up behind him without detection. Since we aren't in combat, we can cast Poison Mist without it costing stamina. The Tree Sentinel will begin to take damage from the poison, but because the cloud itself doesn't damage him, we never draw his aggro. Since we never draw his aggro, we never enter combat, and Poison Mist won't cost stamina for the entirety of his health bar. It's a pretty neat interaction between some specific mechanics that let us kill the Draconic Tree Sentinel without being detected. Although, the whole process does take about 17 minutes, so it's certainly not the quickest strategy. However, it does let us pop one of our Golden Foul Feet before he dies to increase the amount of runes he'll drop to 64,999. That's a lot of levels early on. Specifically, we need to get levels in Dex, Intelligence, and Strength for weapons we'll use throughout the run, and the rest will go into our HP. We'll use the last of our runes to upgrade the Rotten Stray to plus 6. I think we're about ready to take on Stormvale, and first up is Margit. We bring in Sorcerer Roger and the Rotten Stray. The strategy here is to let the Rotten Stray afflict Scarlet Rot on the boss, and then hope that our summons can stall out the boss for as long as possible. With enough time, the Scarlet Rot should kill the boss, especially if the summons can get enough damage in. This is a bit more tricky than it sounds though, as Roger and Rotten Stray aren't quite as tanky as we'd like them to be. That being said, we can stand somewhat close by and hope that Margit will swap between targeting our summons and us. Since we can heal, that will waste him a lot of time. It takes a few tries, but eventually, we find the run. Margit goes down. Navigating Stormville sounds like it should be a nightmare without mobility, but with some fairly tricky movement we can actually avoid a majority of the ballistas at the main gates and grab a checkpoint by the first divine bridge. From there we can use a bit more quick movements to avoid the ballista fire up the stairways and make our way to the courtyard. From there we can use lone wolves to distract the enemies long enough to get us to the next grace and take the nearby elevator in order to reach the grace just before Godric. I was pretty surprised that this route was as easy as it was to do Staminaless. From here we can either poison miss the troll, or get impatient and book it in order to reach Nefeli. Talking to her will unlock her summon for Godric, which will be very much appreciated while we're still defenseless. For Godric we'll use the same strategy as Margit, letting her summon stall out the fight while Scarlet Rot does the heavy lifting. The start of phase 2 was a little scary, but eventually we get away from him. Once our summons are down, it's actually pretty easy to avoid Godric. He moves pretty slowly, and he can get stuck on objects throughout his arena. Godric succumbs to the Scarlet Rot on the first try. That's one great rune to our name and halfway to the capital, but more importantly we can now tell Roger we killed Godric when we speak in Roundtable. This is where he'll give us his rapier which comes with the Ash of War carrion phalanx. And for some reason, despite a spell identical to this one costing stamina, the carrion phalanx weapon art does not cost any whatsoever. We'll apply it to our Lord Sworn Greysword in order to hopefully give it a high amount of base damage and then collect the upgrades we need around the world. Smithing 1s and 2s can be found all over the place, and Smithing Stone Bell Bearing 2 is just in a chest. 
Not a whole lot to see here, but while we're grabbing upgrade materials, I make sure to kill a hidden scarab in the Altus moat to grab Prayerful Strike. Put a pin in that one though, we'll come back to it a bit later. Since we've killed our first Great Rune Bearer, we can also do White Mask Vari's quest line, which was patched to be accessible offline. We can collect the invasions we need by using the Red Fingers at a summon sign in Altus Plateau, and then we'll head to the Madness Village. We'll make sure to grab Shabiri's well while we're here. Put a pin in that one too. Meanwhile, we can use the Dead Maiden in the Church for the blood we need for Vare. Doing this quest will let us access the Mogwin's Palace early, which will let us access the Palace Approach Ledge Grace. This is the usual spot where you can hit a bird with an arrow to grab its aggro and let it fall to its death to farm a lot of runes very quickly. Typically, firing this arrow would cost stamina, but since we fire it before we enter combat, this rune farming method is completely stamina-less. The next goal on our list is to enter the capital, which means we'll need to take out another rune bear. This is where things start to get really tricky. Rinala's first phase is a nightmare while we're still reliant on our Ash summons. With so many enemies in the room, it's going to be a miracle if our Ashes ever attack the right target at the right time, and we don't have nearly enough FP to brute force our way through the fight in our current state. Rykard is also going to be a pretty big no right now since we can't use the Serpent Hunter without stamina, and that's assuming we could even make it through the Noble. Which leaves us with Radon. Killing Radon would actually be a pretty huge boon for the run. We could unlock Nocron and get our hands on the Mimic tier, we could purchase his armor set which would be a massive defense upgrade, and we could finally get into the capital. There's just one problem. We can't summon our ashes in Radon's arena. Instead, we have to rely on the NPC summons, and they don't exactly do a good job at killing him. That being said, if we can get our hands on the main weapon of our run then it might be possible to take him down. Let's get to work. Our next stop is Sage's Cave in Altus. Navigating this place without stamina is tricky business, but by using quitouts to reset the enemies back to their spawn points we can slowly make our way through the cave. Eventually, we make our way to Necromancer Garrus. Our main goal is to control the amount of mobs that are in the fight by using Carrion Phalanx and let the Scarlet Rot deal as much damage as possible. That's a lot easier said than done, but eventually we slay the Necromancer and claim the Family Head's Flail. The weapon art to the Family Heads is a unique weapon art called Familial Rancors, which fires off several skull-like balls that'll home in on their target. It's a surprisingly effective art, although it does leave us relatively open to attack. We'll go ahead and make our way through the world and grab enough somber smithing stones to take the Family Heads up to plus 6 and make our way to Radon. To call Stamina's Radon tricky is an understatement. Even avoiding his initial set of arrows requires some fairly tight timings with mounting and dismounting Torrent, but actually fighting him is a whole different ballgame. Without the ability to dodge or sprint, it becomes very difficult to escape him once he's locked on target. A few of his moves can be avoided by mounting and dismounting Torrent, but with how hard he hits we barely survive a number of his attacks, let alone the full combos. We died quite a few times in comparison to the other bosses in early to mid game, 11 times in total, and those attempts weren't exactly short. At a certain point, I decided to stop and grind for more health levels, and that was a massive help in the long run. I eventually found that staying close and spamming out as many Rancors as I could was the way to go. The quicker this fight ended, the better. Eventually, on try number 12, we found the attempt where we very narrowly defeated the Star Scourge. Now that Radon is down, the game has opened up to us in two massive ways. As our second great rune holder, we can now access the capital, but just as importantly, we can now access the city of Nokron. This place is going to hold possibly the most important upgrade of the run. First though, we'll have to make our way there. Getting across the Rune City is a bit tricky since the Silver Tears can aggro from a pretty far distance, but being patient and luring them into Rancor range will let us clear them out with no issue. There's one boss on our way to our prize, and it's the Mimic Tier. 
The Mimic tier copies everything that we're wearing, which would make it a tricky battle, but by unequipping all of our gear as we enter the arena, we can force the Mimic tier to be a nearly harmless opponent. Normally I'd feel bad about pulling tactics like this, but this is stamina list we're talking about. The gloves are off. Next we'll have to navigate the Sacred Grounds, and this was definitely trickier than I anticipated. Because of how the Silver Tears work, they'll force you into combat from a pretty far distance away, which makes this first gap difficult to cross. However, we can get just far enough by walking into it, and then use the Rancors to clear us out of combat. I didn't expect this to give us any issues, but ultimately did trip us up once or twice, so I figured I'd bring it up. Once we're inside the chapel, we can use the Stone Sword Key Door and finally claim the most powerful summon in the game, the Mimic Tier. The Mimic Tier is already pretty infamous in the community, but just in case you haven't happened to cross it yourself, it's an Ash Summon that will copy everything your character is wearing and has on their item belt. It's an extremely versatile summon, but there are some aspects about it that we can take advantage of in order to make it an amazing tool for Staminaless Elden Ring. The first step is to make it as tanky as possible while still being able to medium roll, as it copies both our armor and our equip load stats. Radon's armor is going to be our armor of choice, and we can immediately take the summon to plus 6. The next thing to keep in mind is to get it its own weapon, as I have a much better idea than letting it run around with familial heads. I'm going to be grabbing the Great Star's Great Hammer for its weapon of choice, which restores a little bit of HP every time it hits a target. But more importantly, we'll give it the Prayerful Strike, a weapon art that gives the user a massive amount of poise and strikes with an overhead attack that heals the user and surrounding allies. Most builds would only benefit so much from this weapon art, as the heal isn't that big on a player. But the heal is actually a percentage of the user's health, and if there's one thing Mimic Tier has a lot of, it's health. This in combination with Shibiri's Woe Talisman is going to turn the Mimic Tier into a massive tank. Shibiri's Woe causes the user to be more likely to draw enemies' attention, so if we equip it as we summon the Mimic Tier and then remove it from our own character, it'll make the bosses far more likely to attack our summon. The sustain from Prayerful Strike and Great Stars will make it last for potentially as long as it can land hits, since the Mimic Tier actually has an unlimited amount of focus points. From here, the run is going to split into two halves, creating the most effective loadout for the Mimic Tier, and creating the best stamina-less loadout for ourselves. The run is far from over, but with the Mimic Tier in hand, a vast number of bosses just became far easier. After juicing up the Great Stars, we tear through Loretta and progress through Rani's questline. This will give us the upgrades we need to plus 10 our Mimic tier, as well as the last pieces towards making a maxed out family heads. We'll get the final Somberstone in Mogwin's Palace to get us topped off. We can also pick up the Carrion Filigreed Crest from EG, a talisman that reduces the amount of focus our weapon arts cost. We'll swap this out for Shibiri as well when we're summoning Mimic and re-equip it as we switch back to our personal setup. The all-you-can-eat noble is the next one for us to take on, and as long as we hide from the rolling attacks, he's not too much of an issue. The second half of Volcano Manor is definitely a more stressful process, since the Abductor Virgin, the spooky Iron Maiden thing, is nearly impossible to get away from. So to get through this section, we'll go ahead and hang far out into the lava area so that way we can roll out of combat and completely ignore the Maiden. Then we'll slowly make our way through the lizard section and on to Rykard. We may have no way to use the Serpent Hunter or its weapon art, but nothing is stopping the Mimic Tier from using it. That being said, I have absolutely no faith that the Mimic Tier is going to solo this fight on anything less than a plus 7 spear. Our main issues with Somber Stones is going to be 7, so we're going to have to progress a little bit through the capital to start collecting them. This is where we ran into one of Elden Ring's unique forms of stamina loss. Falling. I have no interest in taking the stairs, since the rooftops are going to let us navigate around most of the tricky enemies. In order to do that, we're going to need to figure out how to do this drop without consuming stamina. 
Thankfully, this is going to be about as easy as just letting our Rancors manually clear out the bubble blowers. Once we do so, we'll exit combat long enough to make the drop. Not a huge hurdle in the slightest, but again, an issue I never saw coming during planning this run. The next segment by Avenue Balcony was also pretty painful to navigate through, as the Lanedale Knights are very perceptive and will force you into combat from massive ranges. Not even to mention how relentlessly they'll chase you down once they've got their sights set on you. Eventually I managed to get the Archer close enough to kill with Rancors, which gave me enough time to get into the Shunning Grounds. Here I'm able to hunt down the Crawling Hands for my Somber 7. We'll go ahead and use it to make a plus 7 Serpent Hunter and give it a shot at Rykard. To put it lightly, Mimic Tear sucks at this fight. Sometimes he'll clear out the Serpent with little effort and get obliterated by Rykard, other times he struggles to even clear Phase 1. This fight is essentially gambling on how smart the Mimic Tear is going to be, and we're honestly just here to witness the carnage. There's not a whole lot we can do about this one at the moment, so rather than gambling on Mimic Tear, I figured it would probably be more productive to go clear out what we can control. Back in the capital, we can use some quitouts to reset the knights and give ourselves the necessary space to stay out of combat. From there, it's just a casual jog to make our way to Sunny D. Godfrey. I was a little worried his stomps and dashes may pose issues for us, but our Rancors do fantastic damage and Mimic Tear didn't have any issues keeping itself alive. That's the Piss Ghost on the first try. For Morgoth, I was already pretty confident, but I wasn't going to take any chances. I brought Melina with us and got to work as living Rancor artillery. As long as we made sure to stay topped up whenever he switched his attention to us and stayed out of the way of his large attack areas, there wasn't much danger to be had here. Morgot is more gone on once again the first attempt. Before we move on to the Forbidden Lands, I went ahead and took some time to get the Serpent Hunter up to plus 9. It's not going to be a massive upgrade, but if there's any way I could increase Mimic's chance of beating Rykard at this point, I'm gonna take it. I really wanted to clear out Rykard before I moved on to the later parts of the game, so that meant letting Mimic Tear have more goes at his snaky adventure. At least the nice thing about this fight is I get to sit back and watch him do all the work for once. And one of my cats decided to keep me company while I waited, which made this a nicer process. I really wish there was more to say about this other than giving Mimic Tear fire resistance, an upgraded spear, and a pat on the back, but hoping for the best is about all there is to it. Staminaless Rykar turned out to be an RNG check, which took the Mimic Tear about an hour to finally clear. As we head into the later stages of the game, I figured now would be a good time to pick up our next Staminaless Ash of War. In hindsight, it may have been somewhat useful earlier, but there wasn't much need for it before now. At the village of the Albanorix in Lyernia, we can take out another Loot Scarab to claim the Vow of the Indomitable. This is a shield weapon art that turns the user briefly invulnerable in exchange for a bit of focus points. And as you may have guessed, its major upside is that it takes zero stamina to cast. This will give us a good defensive option that I guarantee we'll need headed into the Land of the Giants and beyond. Crossing into the Forbidden Lands without stamina at first had me worried, but we can use Torrent's mobile dismount to give ourselves a very small leap with no stamina costs. It's an easy trick that'll let us get through most of the platforming in Land of the Giants. While we're here, we can also start grabbing upgrade materials for great stars as well as the sacred tears for our flask. I decided at this point I should probably clear out some of the earlier bosses, and I was a bit worried about having the chance to summon Mimic Tear in Estelle's boss fight. So I went ahead and got the Opaline Bubble Tear in case I needed to eat a hit for summoning Mimic Tear and made my way to the Natural Born. Fun fact, apparently when arriving at the spot just before Estelle, the game considers you to still be in combat for some reason. I only realized this because it forced me to take a very annoying reset. Again, the weirdest things in this game are catching me off guard. Estelle was definitely an interesting fight. Vow of the Indomitable gets a ton of value in its debut fight, giving us the ability to avoid several attacks throughout the encounter. Mimic Tear had a particularly difficult time in landing its prayerful strikes this time around, so we had to put in more work than I'd initially expected. I definitely should have come in with more blue flasks to support the Mimic Tear. But nonetheless, we managed to narrowly clutch it out on our first attempt. Bambi Plus is next on my list, and I was pretty surprised on how much of a fight it put up. There's not much to talk about other than Mimic and I slowly chasing it around and barely won on our first attempt, but I was actually pretty satisfied on how much of a real fight Regal put up. This was probably my most enjoyable experience I've had at this boss so far.
Now ahead of us, we have two major goals. Defeating Nile to gain access to the consecrated snowfields and a majority of the remaining optional remembrances, and the Fire Giant, who now stands as the gatekeeper to the endgame. I'm not particularly confident in my chances against either of these bosses. I'm worried that Nile's soldiers are going to easily swarm us, and Fire Giant without sprinting, jumping, or rolling sounds like it's going to be a living hell. However, if we can make our way into the consecrated snowfields, we can get our hands on the last stamina list weapon. And once Fire Giant is down, we can potentially max out our Mimic Tier's Great Stars. Getting over these two hurdles will mean we're well on our way to the endgame. I think it's going to be easier to take on Nile, but let's go ahead and set up for Fire Giant. I go ahead and clear out a Magma Worm to progress Alexander all the way to the Fire Giant, and head to the Dragon Barrow Cave and... take a guess where, and clear out the Beastmen to get my hands on the Flame Drake Talisman plus two. Hopefully this will keep us somewhat safe from the Fire Giant's magic. Getting through Castle Soul was actually easier than I initially expected. Not a whole lot of stuff gave us trouble as we strolled up to the First Grace. The second section, on the other hand, was definitely a bit more tricky to maneuver through. For once, I actually found it easier to use the Castle Saul Elevator, which is a shortcut I usually don't care much for. Kind of cool though that it gets to see some use in this run. Time for Commander Nile, and it seems my concerns were somewhat well founded. The two knights can easily dogpile a target, whether it be me or the Mimic tier, which will almost always end the fight. At first I thought maybe forcing Nile into a second phase to despawn the knights might be the play, but that turned out to be a bust. Funny enough, the optimal strategy was to just let the knights dogpile our Mimic and do our best to clear out the knights with Rancors. Once we narrowed it down to just Nile, Mimic had no problem keeping itself alive and eating all of his attacks. It took a few tries, but in a battle that was easier than expected, the commander goes down. Fire Giant is next up on my list, and I was ready to go through torture. We bring out Mimic Tear and Summon Alexander into the mix, and begin to slowly make our approach. Funny enough, our Rancors were doing far more damage than I was initially expecting, and come to find out that Alexander is a tank. I don't know what that jar is made of, but whatever it is, it can tank a surprisingly large amount of attacks from the Fire Giant. Even better, we can surprisingly walk out of most of the Fire Giant's fire spells. Maybe this won't be so bad after all. The optimal strategy turned out to be an all-out rushdown for Phase 1. Of course, by rushdown I mean slowly jogging at him and hoping for the best, but it's the thought that counts. If the three of us are able to dogpile the giant, we can pretty easily shatter his bandage, and Alexander does a surprising amount of poise damage, which means we have a good chance at staggering him. Phase 2, we used our usual strategy of staying towards the back and the sides and just let the tanky boys take the main brunt of the force. With his attention split between the three of us, it wasn't too tricky to heal through what attacks we did take. Once again, it may have taken us a few tries, but eventually we slay the fire giant without consuming stamina. With Farah Missoula open, our next goal is to target the Godskin duo. Killing these two will net us the last spell bearing which we need to upgrade the great stars for Mimic tier. Although, without the options to shoot arrows or throw pots, we are without a way to put them to sleep, easily their biggest weakness. At least, that's what you'd think, but funnily enough, the final stamina list weapon awaits us in the Consecrated Snowfields, a weapon that has the ability to put things to sleep, and for some reason has a weapon art that doesn't consume stamina. On the back of a wagon far up in the snowstorm, we get our hands on St. Trina's Torch. The Fires of Slumber weapon art unleashes a wave of purple fire that applies sleep to everything it hits. This could be a big tool for the Godskin duo. I also figure since we're going to be killing multiple mobs, it would be worth picking up the Ancestral Spirit Horn charm to give ourselves small FP replenishments throughout the fight. Making our way through Tornado Alley was one of the places I was most concerned about for platforming, especially since we don't have Torrent to make the tiny hops. Turns out, most of the gaps were easily cleared just by walking along the right paths. There was one jump at the end that I did get caught on for a second, but just by quitting out and resetting the enemies, we were able to make it across. For the Godskin duo, I went ahead and brought in Bernal for the extra help and got to work with St. Trina's Torch. Even with outnumbering the Godskins and using sleep to our advantage, this was no cakewalk. Not being able to dodge against the Godskins can easily be a death sentence. The second Fat Flaps decides to start rolling at you, it's game over. There's no way to quickly stand up without burning stamina, so once he catches you in his rolls, it's over. Funny enough, when it came to this fight, I found that sleep actually wasn't the way to go. 
Because of the family had surprisingly good scaling, we do quite a bit of damage with our Rancors. Instead of wasting time trying to put the Godskins to sleep, it turned out to be far more effective to just try and DPS them down as fast as possible. Although it did take some clever positioning and a few very close calls, we managed to get through the duo after a few tries. Without spending any kind of stamina, we defeat the Godskins. At this point, the Great Stars is just being shy of maxed out at plus 24. We're reaching endgame levels, and ahead of us we have some incredibly tough challenges. Now's about a good time to go backwards and clean up anything we missed. First on my list is Rhea Lucaria. Getting through here didn't provide many issues except for the lift section. I was able to get onto the elevator just fine, but I quickly realized at the top of the lift I was still in combat and had no way to actually get off. Although, the situation was quickly rectified by just resetting enemy aggro by quitting out and loading back in. Simple enough solution. For Clifford the Wizard, I'm pretty glad we decided to take him on so late, because dealing with his fast attack style early on would have been a nightmare. It's weird to think that a boss fight ended up being a break for me, but Mimic's got this one, so no sweat. Getting through the second section of Ray Lucario was even more uneventful to traverse, and then we found ourselves at the Grand Library against Renala. Renala we brushed off earlier because we basically had no damage with only our Phalanx, and I'm pretty sure that we would have run out of FP far too quickly for this to be viable earlier on. Even now our damage is pretty pitiful with Familial Rancors. We're also hugely dependent on Ashes putting in work on this run, and it would take several miracles in a row for a summon, let alone the Mimic tier, to actually perform the Renala puzzle correctly and then target her before she reset. Keep in mind they'd probably have to do this for several cycles, and then go on to do most of the heavy lifting in Stage 2. But as long as we can get the Mimic to Phase 2, then we should be golden. So how do we get through that tricky first phase? The answer is actually pretty simple. We bring out Mimic Tier Phase 1 and just let it start killing everything. If we equip the Ancestral Spirit Horn, then for every thing that dies, we recover FP. Mimic Tier doesn't have to attack the right targets, it just needs to keep killing things. This will heal itself and make it sustain for the entire first phase, and will provide me with essentially unlimited focus points. Funny enough, Mimic Tier did seem to get bored waiting for Phase 2 and did end up finishing up the first phase himself. Once it was time for the actual showdown with the Moon Mommy, we just needed to stay alive. The rest was up to Mimic. Staminaless Renala goes down. The next remembrance we need to grab is off the Lich Dragon, so let's make our way there. First in the way are Vulgar Gargoyles. I was a bit worried that these guys were going to put up a massive fight, but saving them for the second half of the game seemed to be a good idea because the Mimic and I plowed straight through them. Fun fact, the coffin problem that exists in Lake of Rot also happens here. I... Yeah, I've got no clue what's going on here. Navigating up the deep root depths branches took some patience, but nothing that stopped us for too long. Fia's champions were as uninteresting as they usually are, and then we made our way to the Vertigo Towers in order to get the death mark. I think most people would expect this place to be a pain to navigate through, but it was surprisingly easy. We were able to stroll past most of the enemies, and then when we made it to the drop we just quit it out and reloaded. Simple as that. With the death mark in hand, it's time to take on Fortisax. The Lich Dragon isn't particularly tricky. He doesn't deal crazy amounts of damage, so getting hit isn't a super big worry in this fight. It doesn't take too long for the Lich Dragon to go down. We go ahead and finish off Rani's questline, I don't know why to be honest, but it's nice to get it over with, and begin to make our way through Tornado Valley Part 2. There's a lot of drops and gaps that had me worried, but by being patient about clearing out enemies and quitting out, we can make it through without too much trouble. The bird segment in particular had me worried since the dragon spamming lightning made me believe we were going to be without breaks, and birds without stamina sounds awful. That being said, the birds were surprisingly easy to clear out, and for some reason the game doesn't consider us in combat while the dragon is spamming lightning. Feels weird, but I'm not going to question it. Getting into the next boss room seemed like it was going to be pretty tricky since the Draconic Tree Sentinel stands right outside and has a tendency to hit the player as they enter the boss room. To make things worse, we can't actually summon to fight him, so we'd have to solo a Staminaless Tornado Land Scale Draconic Tree Sentinel. Doesn't sound like it's going to be fun. The one saving grace is that combat doesn't start until the horse finishes its aggro animation, which thankfully can be timed just right to enter the boss room. To do this, I used audio cues to tell me when it was safe to stop sprinting.
And then the true challenge began. Beast Clergyman and Malekith the Black Blade, a two-phase boss fight that's already tricky to manage in a regular fight, but imagine taking stamina out of the equation. This is an entirely different level of difficult. Beast Clergyman will often begin the fight by charging after the player on a very narrow platform. He moves very quickly already, and his moves are extremely tricky to get away from. Summoning Mimic Tier will more often than not make us take multiple hits, but not having Mimic out means Clergyman will relentlessly chase us across his arena. We have to open this fight with Mimic in its loadout, take the time to get away, and switch into our Staminaless loadout. Sounds fairly simple, but there's so much that can go wrong very quickly. Mimic Tier can get knocked off the side of the arena, we could take way too many hits trying to get away from him, or Mimic Tier could just straight up lose the fight against Clergyman altogether. We're only in phase one and things can get very out of control very fast. But phase one pales in comparison to what comes next. I knew that phase two would be tricky, but nothing clergyman does comes even close to Malekith. Not being able to dodge, sprint, jump, or avoid in basically any way is an absolute death sentence against Malekith. His attacks and movements are even faster than phase one, but now his attacks come in larger combos with black flames. The damage over time and health reduction on his sword attacks are dangerous to more than just us. If left alone, he will shred the Mimic tier. Our Rancors aren't super effective either. While the damage is decent, it's difficult to find a chance to attack since he'll be able to jump away from us so easily. But never mind our own damage, the window we create for Malekith to jump on us whenever we attack is far too great. If Malekith tags us with one of his combos, then there is absolutely no escape. When he flies into the air, the run can end right then and there, and we have absolutely no say on the matter. And before you ask, yes, the Blasphemous Claw does take stamina. Eventually, the strategy had to change. We needed to find a way to give ourselves even a fighting chance, let alone a solid strategy. From previous runs, I remembered that Scarlet Rot was pretty effective against Malekith. Maybe if I could find a way to apply it and stall out the fight, then just maybe we could grab a miracle victory. After taking some time to look into it, I was eventually able to settle on the Rotten Battle Hammer from the Consecrated Snowfields. It's easily upgradable at this point in the game since it takes standard smithing stones, and Lost Ashes of War let us duplicate our Prayerful Strike onto its L2. At first I was hoping that Scarlet Rot would carry over from Phase 1 into Phase 2, but that didn't turn out to be the case. While that's unfortunate, it's not entirely the end of the world. Looks like Scarlet Rot will also have to be applied in Phase 2. But the chances of that happening, incredibly slim. In all of my attempts, only twice was my Mimic actually able to get Scarlet Rot taking into Phase 2. Only two times. The chances of Mimic getting Rot off was exceptionally small. Mimic had to land several hits in succession, and that implied that the Mimic was alive long enough to do so. But, the second time Scarlet Rot was applied, I was ready for it. It was an exceptionally close battle, one where every small amount of movement counted, but eventually, we managed to defeat Malekith, the Black Blade. That was incredibly rough, but FromSoft was kind enough to give us a Gideon breathing break once the nightmare was over. Nothing of note to see here. We're getting closer and closer to the end of the game, and Godfrey was the next one up. On our first attempt, we found out that we could very easily find ourselves getting comboed out. However, the attacks here are spaced out much more than Malekith's. Vow of the Indomitable does a fantastic job here at keeping us safe, and to save on healing I'll also be using it to avoid stomps throughout the fight. On attempt number two, we get through phase one fairly smoothly, but Horalu in my head sounds like it's going to be pretty rough. With the number of grabs in his arsenal and the ability to rush down his targets quickly, I got pretty worried. But it turns out that Mimic Tear had no trouble keeping itself alive for most of the fight, and his grabs did far less damage than I expected them to. 
Top that off with the Rotten Duelist Hammer getting a Scarlet Rot proc, and you have a recipe for second try, Elden Lord Godfrey. At this point in the run, patch 1.07 arrived to Elden Ring, and with it I was initially worried that they may have added stamina cost to my methods. Happy to report that that wasn't the case, and my run was still alive and valid. But notable changes from the patch included not only a general increase in poise for players across the board, but also included a buff for the familial rancors, which greatly increased the range of the projectiles that would chase down targets. All around, the patch provided buffs all across our character's build. It got me pretty stoked not only to take on the finale of the game, but also to dive head into the super bosses and bonus areas. First of the batch we'll take on is Moog. I'd like to talk about the gritty details of this battle, but Moog was actually fairly standard. Let the Mimic tier take the brunt of the force and provide support from behind with familial heads. The Bloodfire did very little against our poise, and Mimic had absolutely no trouble keeping itself alive. Even without stamina, the Blood Lord goes down on the first attempt. The other boss we have direct access to at the moment is Placid Dusax, but making the run down to him is going to be its own little challenge. The drops to the platforms leading down to him are long enough to actually drain our stamina, so we'll have to exit combat before beginning our descent. Thankfully, quitting out saves the day once again when used in the right position. As long as we can reload the game far enough out of the way, the enemies will leave us alone as we descend. Dragonlord Placid Dusax is an interesting fight. You'd think with how large he is, it would be easy for the Mimic tier to constantly regenerate its health, but Prayerful Strike has a lot of trouble landing. Not only is Mimic tier in danger, but because of how large of an area his attacks cover, we have to be careful about not getting hit too. This is another fight that we can take advantage of out of the Indomitable. Not only will it help with his teleporting attacks as he moves between phases, but it also has a lot of general uses to keep us safe. When timed right, it can even be used to negate the dragon's massive explosion attack. The trickiest part about this fight is actually having enough resources to get through. Not only do we get hit a lot, but Placid Dusax is a very tanky boss. Getting through his entire health bar before he can get through ours is a chore, especially since his flying and teleportation can make it really difficult to land our Rancors. In the end, there really was no major shakeups to the strategy I had to make. Instead, it was mostly learning to manage the resources we had in the battle. In our final attempt, our Mimic tier may have fallen, but a perfectly timed poise break won us the day. The Dragon Lord was slain. The final remembrance for us to chase on our list before we can end the game belongs to the Goddess of the Scarlet Rot. In order to make it there though, we face a... different kind of challenge. Ordina the Liturgical Town is a unique kind of puzzle in Elden Ring. Inside of this town are a set of gates that will lead us to the Halig Tree, where we'll find our final remembrance, but in order to open those gates we'll need to complete the Candle Puzzle. Inside of the Everjail version of the town there are four statues holding candles, and all four must be lit, but stopping you along the way are invisible black blade assassins along the ground, and on the rooftop Albanoric archers are ready to shoot you down. It's a tricky segment to do traditionally, but we aren't playing traditionally, we're playing without stamina. If the archers or assassins spot us on our way through the Everjail, then combat will begin. If that happens, there's going to be no way for us to traverse the rooftops. The problem is, navigating the area and exiting combat is extremely tricky here. Quitting out and loading back in puts you outside the Everjail, the archers can fire at us from ranges far outside our Rancor range, and in order for the familial heads to track the black knives, we'd have to be able to see them. While there is a torch that lets us view the invisible black knives, the problem here is we have to two-hand our family heads in order to cast its weapon art, and by the time we begin to cast the weapon art, the torch is put away and the assassins disappear again. It took a few attempts in order to figure out how exactly I was supposed to approach the puzzle. Pretty early on, I was able to make it to one of the tower candles without initiating combat. Pretty good start, but moving anywhere from this position almost immediately got us spotted by archers. I also managed to find another ladder at the back of the far side buildings which led me to my next candle. But from here there's assassins and the first archer to block our path. 
Another pretty easy candle, but from this point forward, things are going to be getting much more difficult. The candle located on the ground is just in front of one of the Black Blade assassins, and unlike a fair amount of platforms in the game, there's no weird angle I could find that would let me get on top of the platform. In order to get to this candle, we're either going to have to clear the black knife, or somehow make it to the platform she's directly staring at before she can notice, neither of which seem likely. I tried to fight off the black knife, but it seemed like it was going to be a chore and a half in order to accomplish. Not going to rule this out completely, but let's explore our other avenues first. My other thought was maybe I could remain stealth long enough in order to make it into a spot to jump up to the platform before combat starts. This seems less likely than the fighting option, but might as well give it a try. With a set full of black knife armor, I was able to do... this. That was extremely close. Even watching back as I write this, I still can't believe how close this was. But we were able to find just the right angle to jump up before the black knife started combat. Super close call, but that's candle number three out of the way. The last candle we need is in the tower just above, and while we have the same issue, it's for totally different reasons. In order to access this candle, we need to cross a rooftop section that requires we jump across, but two to three archers block our path and will begin firing on us before we can even reach the halfway point. Even with stealth armor on, we won't be able to get close enough to the ladder before the arrows start flying, so taking our chances with stealth isn't going to do us much good. I tried a few methods of clearing out the archers like Scarlet Rotten Familiar Rancors, but neither of them worked. I went back up to the first candle I cleared to try and get a good layout of the land, and that's when it hit me. I have all three of them within sight. This is the perfect archery post. I may not even need to kill the archers in order to progress. As long as I can knock them off the rooftops to break line of sight, that would be enough. With that in mind, I went ahead and grabbed Radon's Lion Greatbow with his remembrance and put together a small collection of great arrows. Fun fact, this is the first time I've ever used a great bow in a challenge. Actually feels kind of cool. I returned to my perch, great bow in hand, and began to open fire. I wasn't able to get any of them out of sight with the first shot, but by hiding and taking cover we were able to de-aggro each archer, allowing us to take another out of combat shot. And of course, as long as we're out of combat, none of these shots will take any stamina. With the archers cleared out of the way, we can finally make our way to the final candle of Ordina. Lighting it means we've completed one of the trickier segments of the game, and all without draining our green bar even once. Now that we've finally made our way to the Halic Tree, we can get back to our old section clearing ways. There were a lot of tricky spots all throughout the section, especially the bits with the spirit calling snails and their crystalline friends. This was probably one of the more difficult sections to traverse Staminalis, but the strategies were mostly the same, so I'll spare you the details. At the end of the Halic Tree section, we reached the second boss fight against Loretta. This was a fight I was a bit concerned about because of her high speed and damage, but I almost feel bad about how badly this boss got bullied. I don't know if this was an RNG thing, but poor Loretta got trapped in the corner of her own arena. Just about the only thing she can do while pinned there is start counting out the runes we earned. Elfail was next up on our list, and this place was surprisingly easier than the Halic Tree. This place was mainly a compilation of quitouts in order to reach the end of the first area, and then using health regeneration to combat the Scarlet Rot Pools. Not a whole lot to see here. And then, it was finally time to take on the Blade of Mikola herself, Melania. After I walk into the boss fight with the wrong setup two times in a row. The battle against Melania I knew was going to be a long one. There was no way that I was going to try this fight solo, but putting a Mimic tier in front of Melania gave her a nice chunk of ghost meat to constantly heal off of. The thing is, Melania also struggles to kill the Mimic tier. Prayerful Strike keeps the Mimic nice and healed up, and in most circumstances is going to knock her to the ground. As long as we can stay alive and out DPS her healing, I think we've got this one in the bag. There were of course times when she would pivot and target us with some of her more mobile abilities, but as long as we could avoid most of the damage with Vow of the Indomitable, then things should turn out mostly okay. Shabiri's Well will almost immediately turn focus back to the Mimic tier, so as long as we're careful about surviving, it shouldn't be too much of a big deal. 
Her special attacks in second phase are what concerned me the most, but once again Shabiri's woe came in clutch. Melania barely ever took the time to target us, and once again staying in close combat with the Mimic kept it topped off. I feel weird about saying this, but Staminaless Melania has been the easiest experience I've ever had at this boss. When we walked into this room with the right setup, we took out the Scarlet Goddess without dodging, attacking, parrying, or any other stamina costs on our first try. I'm being 100% genuine when I say this might be a super effective strategy on her. A Shapiri's Woe self-sustaining Mimic tier and tank gear to soak up the damage, and then support it with ranged attacks. Sure, it's not the super fun sword duel I enjoy, but it's a viable strategy for any of you who are struggling to take her out. As we began to recover from being totally flabbergasted about our Melania experience, I realized something. We only had one more challenge left to go before the run was complete. One more final boss, and we had cleared possibly the world's first All Remembrances Staminaless run. If only I knew how much of a challenge awaited me. Radagon and the Elden Beast. The finale of Elden Ring, and in this run, possibly the pinnacle of its difficulty. If I had to say between what the trickiest boss in this run was between Beast Clergyman Malekith or Radagon Elden Beast was, it would be very difficult to answer. Radagon isn't too tricky to take on by himself. He's a fairly standard boss fight with Mimic Tier tanking and us supporting, but the main difference is Radagon can pivot very quickly between targets. Some of his attacks are extremely difficult to avoid with just Vow of the Indomitable, and whenever he grabs one of us, he becomes completely invulnerable. He's a bit more difficult than the average fight, but most of the time we clear him without any issues. At least in isolation. Because dear god, the Elden Beast is an entirely different level. I want you to imagine fighting the Elden Beast without ever sprinting, dodging, or jumping. That in itself is a challenge, but add in everything else stamina list, and this battle becomes excruciating. If you aren't close enough to the beast when its fire breath comes out, then you're getting hit. No questions asked. When its barrage comes out, you're more than likely getting chunked by it. Its special Elden Rings attack is extremely hard to work around at times, and you better be ready for those grab attacks because even through plus two defense talismans, they hurt. It's not just the Elden Beast attacks that are an issue though, it's even hitting the thing that really stings. With how fast it moves, it's hard to keep up with it using our basic jog, and it's able to escape our Rancors extremely easily. To top it off, Mimic Tear has a very difficult time hitting it with Prayerful Strike to keep itself alive. I even tried to switch into a Blasphemous Blade build and it still had trouble getting through the health bar. This fight took hours. The problem here is that even if Radagon is just a simple boss to get through, it can totally sabotage a run at the Elden Beast. There's a good chance that Mimic Tear can be heavily damaged coming out of Phase 1, and sometimes Radagon will just outright kill you before you even get the chance to test your luck. In an ironic way, in a stamina battle against a god, a lot of it is really just praying that things are going to go your way. Praying that Mimic Tear will enter Phase 2 healthy, praying that Elden Beast will choose decent attacks for you to get damage off, Praying that you'll eventually get a poise break. Praying that Mimic Tear will finally be able to sustain itself. A lot of this fight is doing the absolute best you can with the things you can control, and hoping the things you can't just go right. The build we finally settled on was our usual setup, but this time we've added the Shard of Alexandria to increase our damage for the Rancors. Even with the damage increase in this setup, things are extremely dire. But it's always just within our grasp. Some of these attempts are getting so close, I can feel it. The end is near. And then, on one fateful attempt, the Elden Beast wound up for its multi-ring attack. And then... We finally got it. Not only a poise break, but THE poise break. The one that sealed the fate of a god. The one that destroyed the Elden Beast. The final remembrance. The final boss. And the final challenge of Elden Ring. With it completed, we have finally completed all of Elden Ring without consuming stamina.
This may have been to date the most ambitious challenge I've ever taken. This whole challenge felt like at any moment it was going to collapse, like at any moment it was going to be over. Finally a moment would arrive when it became impossible, but it never happened. I thought of this challenge before Elden Ring had even come out, and when it finally arrived I just thought of how impossible this challenge would be. But then I took a closer look and began to see the little bits of progress here and there, the little things that slowly came together to form an entire run of the game. I would like to say that while I did personally dig through most of the research of this run, I cannot discredit the amount of additional research that also went into it. We collected a large amount of area backup strategies, looked into alternative boss strats, and a ton of different mimic tier builds. The amount of work that was put into this run was phenomenal. This was a project that I've spent most of 2022 working on, and I'd like to give a special shout out to Dream Wanderer for this particular run. The amount of time and effort he put into this run alongside me was extremely helpful, and being able to bounce ideas off of him and get unique perspectives the whole time made it a much better experience overall. That being said, there's so much about this run that I couldn't fit in the video without making it another 30 to 40 minutes long. So this time around, I'm going to make you all an offer. If you guys would like to see a follow up video with the full uncut boss fights where I can break down my approach and build to each battle, then I'd be willing to put it together. I imagine that anybody who's crazy enough to try this challenge themselves may find it useful. Maybe you guys would just enjoy that style video. If you'd like to see it, let me know down in the comments below. I already know that this video is going to be much longer than my usual challenges, so to all of you who made it here at the end, I just want to give you all a massive thank you for taking time to watch this video. The fact that I get to spend my time with all of you means the absolute world to me, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for watching. And of course, the challenges don't end here. Next time, for the Elden Ring Challenge... It's finally time.